Good morning to each of you. It's good to be with you this morning, and I trust as we worship together that uh, we can be inspired between the, somewhere between 6 and 7 o'clock last evening, made a little family history. We entered the state of Massachusetts for the first time in our lives, and it's been very good to, uh, there's a lot of surprises here for us. I always pictured the New England states as pretty well wall-to-wall -wall houses and, and all genteel uh, estates and stuff like that. And here it looks a lot like Wisconsin, only more so. It's uh, just a lot of trees and stuff like that. And so uh, we've really been in, we really enjoyed our trip out across New York State. It's a long trip, but uh, we're glad to be here with you this morning. We've had some kind of introductory thoughts about the thing of suffering and reconciling that to uh, the goodness of God and, and agree with that. But we're going to uh, be a little different this morning. We're going to talk about glory and, uh, you know, what is the place in our lives for, for glory. And I uh, entitled it, well, I have two parts to my title. I'll just give the first part now, and that is the glory of Zion. And so uh, I would like to begin by reflecting on Zion and then later in the message, maybe zero in on a more specific area of its glory. Now, Zion is first referred to in the Old Testament when it talks about David and his conquest of the Jebusites on this certain piece of real estate uh, in what we know as Israel today in Palestine. And uh, he went there and took a stronghold. And this stronghold was around a, uh, a spring of water. And an archaeological dig began about 1995 and it uncovered a massive fortification of five ton stones, 10,000 pound stones, stacked 21 feet high. And some pottery shards they found dated them to about 3,800 years ago. Now, um, five ton stones, 21 feet high, that's kind of a... I think some of the equipment next door could about do that for us, you know, maybe not quite, but bigger ones easily can. Cranes and stuff we have today, we can go much higher than that. Uh, we were in Chicago last weekend, and you look at those massive buildings, and you wonder, so close together, you wonder how the earth underneath them can support them all. But that was quite an accomplishment in that day. And uh, they're the largest walls that are found in that region, clear from the time of King Herod. And uh, again, it, the water springs were very important in those days. If you got someone's water, you pretty well had them because they couldn't go very long without that. So they wanted to protect their water source. Uh, this would have probably been built about 800 years before King David came on the scene. And the biblical account calls it the Citadel of David or the Citadel of Zion. Now, the word Zion occurs over 150 times in the Bible, and it essentially means a fortification or the idea of being raised up as a monument. And so this Zion is described both as the city of David, this one that he took there, and then also it's considered as the city of God, and as time expanded, excuse me, as time went on, it expanded and kept getting more and more additional meanings and connotations with it. Now, uh, Jer uh, it was originally this, like I said, this Jebusite fortress in the city of Jerusalem, but then Jerusalem became a possession of Israel. And so we have this citadel there on the hill, get that a little bit, but then David built himself a palace beside it there, and that also became included in the area that was called Zion. And then Solomon later was, he came on the scene when Israel reached about its zenith of glory. Then they also included this temple, this magnificent temple, as part of Zion. And then uh, we, found, uh, we find as we keep going through the Bible that uh, they would go up to Zion. And Jeremiah talks about that. He's, he says there in Jeremiah 31, 6, Come, let us go up to Zion, the city of our God. Then later, it came to be a name for the whole city of Jerusalem. And then it expanded until it 
became a name for the whole country of Judah. And then, after a while, as the nation of Israel as a whole is considered in Zion. And I have scriptures for them, but I won't, uh, I won't read those. And so, Zion is used um, in a spiritual sense in scripture to refer even to the people of God. So it isn't just a geographical area. After a while, it's the people of God that are considered Zion. And then as we get into the New Testament, Zion refers to God's spiritual kingdom. In other words, the church. And uh, the apostle says, We have not come into Mount Zion, but unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And we find Peter saying, that Christ is the cornerstone of Zion. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth in him shall not be confounded. So I say that to say, though, it started with this little citadel, and then it expanded and included David's palace, and then it, it, stand, it expanded and, and it also included the area of the temple, and then after a while it included the whole city of Jerusalem, and then after a while it included the whole uh, land of Judah, and after a while it included Israel too, and so we have of the whole nation. Then after it went on from there and expanded and, be, and became known as the people of Israel, the Israelites, and then after a while in the New Testament expanded until it's called the church, the people of God. Now, when it was uh, back again to Jerusalem, when it was originally captured by David, and it appears that what to do this, there was a small waterway that he went through, and they, they challenged him and even mocked him and said, you can't get this. And he said, whoever will go in through that waterway and, and uh, capture that city, and I forget what the reward was there, but some of his men went in there, and they took over the citadel. And at that point, they had control of the highest landmark uh, in the area there, in that ancient city. And about anywhere in that city, you could look up, if you turned and, and looked up there, you could look from about anywhere in the city, you could look up and see this ancient landmark. Now, if you've seen pictures of, Jer excuse me, of Jerusalem, uh, it's kind of heart-shaped. It's a little wider at the top, and then it tapers down to the bottom, and, and it talks a little Nehemiah about how he made a loop around here to uh, assess the damages after the fall of Jerusalem and when they were rebuilding the wall. But there, wherever you looked, as you looked up, you would see this, this citadel here. And that protected the city. It protected their water supply, which was so valuable. And I'm sure as people walked around in that city and they would look up and they would see this citadel that's protecting their water. It gave them, and these stones, these uh, five-ton stones piled 21 feet high. What do we have here? About 16 feet, maybe even higher than the ceiling here. They saw these huge stones there. It gave them a sense of awe and it gave them a sense of security. And, and uh, there was a glory to it. And so eventually, as we look at the word Zion, it even came to mean things that uh, were glorious, victorious and glorious. And the temple that we hear mentioned in the Gospels is, uh, is a magnificent building with a lot of glory. In Luke 21, uh, verses 5 and 6, Five and six. Luke 21, 5 and 6. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And so, in that day, there was this magnificent temple. It hadn't been thrown down yet. And as visitors would come to Jerusalem, they could look up there into that area, right side the citadel up in that area, and they would be able to see 
this magnificent temple that was standing there. And these people knew that God was with these people. And I imagine as they looked there, and as they got wind of some of the things that God had done throughout history for his people, and then they looked up there and saw this magnificent building, and they saw this palace, and they saw this citadel that, prote that protected the wo city's water source. Um, I'm sure that there was a lot of awe and wonder, and possibly even envy, at the security of these people, besides the glory, the security of them. Martin Luther, while he was still an Augustinian monk, was sent from Nuremberg to Rome to an important uh, conference there uh, for, for the monastic order he was part of. And so he went with a fellow monk. They traveled almost 700 miles by foot. And they went through southern Germany and then into Switzerland. And then they went through the snow-covered Alps in the wintertime, down out of the Alps, and... Uh, they moved down to the, in the Italian boot, and they came to a little rise, and for the first time in his life, Martin Luther had a dream fulfilled. He saw the city of Rome. And in those days, people wrongly called it the eternal city. And Luther would refer to it as the holy city. And he fell down prostrate on the ground. He was just overwhelmed with religious zeal. And he cried out, O holy city, O Rome, the city sanctified by the blood of martyrs, I come to you at last. Then he got up off the ground and he walked into Rome. And he discovered what the city was really like. And he was disillusioned by the wickedness and the immorality and the false religion that he saw there. And when he saw how the popes were living and, and the morals and on and on, he was just totally devastated disheartened and delusion, disillusioned by it. And he went back to his order and he was silent for a long time. Because of his disappointment, and the, here he had made this pilgrimage, and that was a lot of the focus of it. He wanted to see Rome and he was so disappointed and delusion, disillusioned by it. You know, I suppose a lot of people could have said that. If you read through the prophets in the Old Testament, a lot of people could say the same thing about Jerusalem. This city, this magnificent glory, like I said, it reaches zenith about at the time of Solomon, and then it kept decaying, and it just kept falling away there. And yet it was the place, the city chosen by God to place his name. Uh, Second Chronicles verse six, chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house in that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be prince over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. So here we have it. God had never chosen a place. He had never chosen a man. They call it, And he says, now I have chosen Jerusalem to be my seat and I have chosen David to be my leader. And so the city stood for people who were uniquely chosen by God and guided by God and blessed by God. And like I said, even probably to the envy of nations. Now, as the people would look up at the citadel, and you've seen pictures of forts and stuff before, they would see some bastions coming out of the side of it. They stuck out over the edge of the wall a ways, and that was so that the watchman could get out and look parallel with the walls. And on the corner, they stuck out both ways. And as people would go through the city and see the, this fort and uh, see watchmen up there, they would see these, these bastions. And they would... Uh, glitter in the sunlight, and it would catch their eye. And I imagine as people look at the Zion of today, there are different bastions on it that are strong points that help with the strength of this city, of this fort, whatever you want to call it here. And, uh, and so each one of these was added strength to it. 
not necessarily for tipping or anything like that, but for for being alert and watchful and and for protecting it. And uh, I think as we think of it, Zion today as a spiritual city of God, I think there are a number of bastions that are s sticking out, so to speak, a number of bastions that are that give strength and security and watchfulness to the people of God. You know, there are things that the world looks at. There are things that the world admires. It doesn't seem like it sometimes. And there's, there are things that they're longing for. Now, I got this idea from a wedding sermon that was preached at a grandnephew's wedding. And the minister there began by talking in a more general way about Zion, and then he focused on one of the bastions that he considered, and that was the bastion of marriage. And, uh, and he talked about, and he kept zeroing in until he talked about selfishness. And uh, he talked about how selfishness can take um, a thing of glory like a godly marriage. And at best, mar it, and at worst, destroy it. And it occurred to me, you know, that there are a number of these bastions that we could focus on, and that I could even have a series of messages on some of these uh, bastions. And we could focus, first of all, on the glory of Zion, and then focus on different bastions of the kingdom of God. And so I went to work, and I studied what I've related to you here. And then... Uh, uh, the first one I used was uh, we focused on the bastion of the glory of the Church of Christ. And, uh, you know, as people see others, see these as other people, the people of the world that do not know God, as they see other people do things that are contrary to what they know that the flesh of these people would desire so that they could obey and honor God, you know, they, they take notice and they even start to ask questions. They say, well, why? Why do the ladies wear those things on their heads? And why don't you vote? And why don't you have televisions? Why don't you drink? And as they see us dress modestly and drive modest vehicles and they live in modest houses, even when we could afford things that are more costly, they may wonder why, but they take notice. It's part of the glory of Zion. 1 Peter 2.7 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And so as people uh, see the brotherhood treating each other in love and living in peace, and they long for peace, and they long for meaningful relationships that will stand the tests of time. And another bastion is the one I already mentioned that I heard at a wedding, and that was the godly marriage. And... Uh, I, I got a picture of how people long for this one time when uh, one of my sons, wasn't Bruce, was the older son, and we were working, and we went out to where two people were working together to look at a machine that needed some work on it. And there was a, a man there that was kind of a, what I would have thought about be the last person who ever, would ever long for anything godly. But uh, we got out there, and, and he and his co-worker must have been having a discussion. Because when we got out there, the first thing he said before he said what problem they were having, he says, how many, how many of your marriages break up? And I said, how would you answer that? I said, I don't know. One out of 100? One out of 50? I said, I don't know. And he looked at his coworker and says, maybe we should all be meites. You know, and there was a man who I would have never dreamed about, and yet he looked upon People with solid marriages. It's a, it was a glory to him. Another bastion would be forgiveness. Some years ago, you've heard about uh, Jeff Schrock's children being killed in that accident in Oregon, and, uh, or Washington, I guess. And uh, the trials that ensued, and, and Jeff was up that week. They were having the, the trial for the, the person that had uh, come across the median and run into their vehicle. And, uh, of course, it was everyone was just so, so awed by, uh, by Jeff and Carolyn's response to that and their forgiveness, and it, it was a glory. It was a glory to the people of God. 
even though they weren't seeking glory, even though they had suffered. And, uh, and so that trial was going on that week. And then at the end of the week, uh, the meetings that we were out for is Bible conference. And uh, that's in quite a few people there and visitors were coming in. But one of the visitors came in, he was by himself and he said, I'm looking for the church that Jeff goes to. And uh, yeah, well, this is the church that Jeff goes to. And basically he was there because of the testimony of Jeff. He said, I wanna see his people, the glory of Zion. We have the nickel mine shooting in Pennsylvania and how people are so awed by the forgiveness there. So that would be another one of the bastions, not the one I'm going to major on. Non-resistance and turning the other cheek would be another one, and there are more. But I want to focus this morning on the, on the Christian home and the Christian family. Now, I start with a little disclaimer here. When, at the time I was ordained, 30-some years ago, I said, I'm not going to preach on the Christian family until my family is raised and maybe not ever. But I realized if everybody took that position, we wouldn't get much teaching, would we, on the Christian family. And I'm not here to tell you, it's not a how-to manual this morning. I want to do it more by way of encouragement and the glory of the Christian family. The, the glory to God and the glory to the world as they look upon the Christian family. There are a few things that the Apostle Paul uses as pictures of the church. And one of them is a human body. Another one is a building, and still another one is the Christian marriage. And so I would like to uh, begin by reading from Genesis chapter 2 at the creation of man and woman. I'd like to read Genesis 2 verses 20 through 25. Adam uh, is on the scene first, and he gave names in verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And he took the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman and brought her unto the wo a man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall, be called, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, although he could have, God did not create Eve out of the dust of the ground like he did the man and all the other animals and beasts and so on. He did not create him out of the, out of the dust of the ground. But he took the literal flesh of man, and in that way, and he made the woman from the flesh of the man. And so they were literally one flesh, literally one flesh. And so the man was in that language, ish, and the woman was isha, literally one flesh. Well, Adam promptly named her, and I don't know for sure, but I think when he looked upon her, he was so overwhelmed by this beautiful creature that was custom crafted not only to his needs, but also to his desires and to his longings. And when he came to face to face with her, what did he say? Maybe he said, me ish, you isha, I don't know. But what do you say? What were the first words spoken between two humans? They were between a man that had just met the, the longings and the needs of his life. We have now the first family. Now, it isn't for every man to have a family, but if he does, you know, I trust he'll learn on, lean on the Lord as he longs and searches for one will who he, be the helper he needs rather than one who will do him harm. And we know a lot of sad stories about that. Well, now let's fast forward uh, a few thousand years and bring us to Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 23 through 33. I'll read those verses, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, as, uh, as Paul speaks of the, the glorious church, he references how Christ so loved the church, his, his chosen, uh, the saved, I guess, that he gave his flesh for it. And we read in John that if we are going to be a part of the church, we need to eat the flesh and drink the, the, the blood. In other words, be partakers of his flesh. And in this way, we share his flesh. Now, uh, as we look back at, at marriage, and uh, we see that the husband and wife are to be one flesh in that way. Take this unique picture of, of uh, sharing the flesh of Jesus as being part of the church. We share the flesh as husband and wives, and uh, we are part of the family. We're the family here. And although husbands and wives don't, we aren't, the, the wives aren't created out of the husbands like even Adam, uh, Eve was out of Adam. But in, in ways even, we do have the combination by the children. Some say, oh, he looks like his dad. Some say he looks like his mom. You know, there's, there's a combination, a combination there. Now, there's, there's no way that you could have separated Adam and Eve's literal flesh back out again like it had been before, and uh, except by the death of one of them, but uh, you can't do it while they're both alive. You can do it legally in the eyes of the land, but you can't do it morally. And so, as the world looks upon the godly home and they see a man and a woman who are committed for life, they see something beautiful and they see something desirable. I worked with a man, an unmarried man, one time. He was up in his 30s. And uh, his name was Rick, but we all called him Snuggles. And the reason for that was we had another Rick at work, and he had a thing, a uh, bug guard on the front of his pickup that said Snuggle Bear on it. And one of the guys started calling him Snuggles. And we all called him Snuggles, and he didn't take any issue with it all. In fact, I think he kind of liked it. And so we always called him Snuggles, but his name was Rick. And uh, Rick uh, went into a Casey's, and, and uh, he uh, made friends with a clerk in there who had a daughter. And uh, they ended up moving in. He moved in with her. And uh, he would babysit her daughter while she would work sometimes. And one day, S Snuggles told me at work, he says, uh, well, I find out tonight if I'm a papa, a father. And I said, Snuggles, I said, have you ever been married? And he says, no, I haven't. And, and I said, was she ever married? And he says, no, she wasn't. I said, well, you should marry her. Oh, he said, I'd like to, but you just can't really trust anybody. And it, it just won't work. I thought I'd hear from him the next day, and I never did. Well, one of my other co-workers said that Snuggles was down. He found out that when he thought she was working, and he was babysitting her daughter. She was actually out running around. They don't know whose child is. But Snuggles is responsible. If it's his, he's responsible. And, by of course, he's, he's out on the street now. He was kicked out of the house, and they you know, had to fight and so on. So he needs to come up with a place to live now. But he is responsible for that child's health care until he's 18. Or hers, it was a boy then. He's responsible until that child is 18 years old. He needs to provide the 
prenatal care. He's responsible for all those expenses. All for the mother who has kicked him out of the house and they're now enemies. No wonder he was down the next day. They would look at a godly marriage and and uh, when uh, when I left when I left home and part of our thing we need to send an email around saying we're going to be gone and I like to say where I'm going because I enjoy when others do they don't all but I said uh, we're going to Massachusetts to visit Bruce's and then we're going to go up into Maine for a couple days to celebrate our 48th anniversary and then visit other children on the way home and one of them wrote back. 48 years, wow, you know, that's no biggie in our circles, is it? No biggie at all, but it is, it is out there. We read about Bill Gates and Melinda who we think have a happy home and all of a sudden they're divorced and, and so on it goes. Well, it's a glory. Our godly marriages are a glory to the world. I could, I could stand up here way longer than you'd want me to and tell you stories that I've heard at work about the soap opera lives, and this one and this one, and then this child, and then they got in a fight, and this one's out of here, and this and da 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 da, and this child here is the third cousin by da, da, da. I mean, they're they're just all. When we talk about the Mennonite game, we can't hold a candle to the world, believe me. And so, uh, you know, we we enjoy living with and among virtuous women whose price is far above rubies that we take it for granted. You know, I enjoy being married to a virtuous woman, and I'm sure you do too. But I enjoy moving and living amongst virtuous women. I enjoy seeing you with your virtuous wife, and I'm sure you enjoy seeing each other with your virtuous wives as well, and faithful husbands. It's one of the glories of Zion. We're only doing our part. It's not about us. You know, when the world sees godly youth who are exemplary in their behavior and their attitudes and in their driving and in their work ethic, you know, they may wonder, my, we sure have some, we, you sure have, you parents are sure fortunate to have youth like that. And we are. We definitely are. And when they see these youth singing in a witnessing event, whether it's in a nursing home or in street meetings, and they often express their appreciation at what they're seeing. And when a family with children goes into a restaurant or a store, and, and uh, you know, what may they see? You know, and often Christian families get compliments on how well be behaved their children are. We had an evangelist that told a story one time that he was going into a store, and he saw a lady... Um, getting the baby out, and then she was kind of, there was about a three-year-old, he guessed it was, uh, you know, also need to go in. He did not want to go into the store. And uh, she tried to to get him out, and he would wriggle loose and stuff like that. And she went again, and he locked the doors of the car, shut the car door and locked it. And she stood there giving him all sorts of threatening looks, and I don't know what all she told him and stuff like that, but he just sat in the, car and belligerently looked out the window at her with the doors locked. And finally, he said about the last thing he saw is that she was going like that at him. That's all she could do. How sad. And that's the story in so many families today. When they, parents can't do anything, they, they holler, holler and scream and everything else at him, and you've heard them all, but they end up, all they can do is do that. How sad. It's a glory when we have godly families with disciplined children. Of course, they're not always perfect, but they can tell if they've been trained to obey and if we follow through. And there again, you and I are not only blessed by godly children, but we're blessed by each other's godly children. Would we want to be part of a group when, if our children were the only disciplined ones there, you know, and, and so uh, it, it's a blessing to, to live amongst godly families and with godly children, godly marriages. Many people uh, uh, 
are just, well, many, we, we just, I should say many people, I think most of us enjoy looking at beautiful flower beds and my wife likes flowers. And so I enjoy seeing her flower beds around the place there. And we enjoy looking at each other's as they, as you ladies would go to each other's, even the men, as you go to each other's places, you enjoy seeing the flowers possibly. But, you know, you enjoy going and looking at other people's flower beds, but you also enjoy your own flower beds. And that's how it is with godly families. We enjoy our own, we enjoy each's, each other's, and we enjoy uh, comparing notes and talking about them even. Many people so badly want to raise good children and they want to have good youth, but they're planting the wrong seeds and they're tending them improperly. And they may seem to be doing okay, and then the children come to a certain age, and they, this godliness they planted seems to wither and die. Psalm 127, 1 through 5, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Uh, one, I heard a man say one time that he was at a wedding, and, and he said that uh, the, and this minister at that, that wedding was telling how the young, he heard of a young couple that had uh, written up a list of their goals and aims in life and they were good but he wanted they said now we would like God to sign his name at the bottom to give his approval and that minister said he thinks there would have been a better way to do that he said they should have given God a blank sheet of paper and had him write out the goals and then they would sign them and so that's 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 our goal for when we have a godly marriage Just let God build the house, and you'll live in a much more durable, enjoyable, and beautiful house than you could have ever built yourself. You're going to have more rest and less sorrows. You know, if God blesses husbands and wives with children, they're a gift that is likened to a mighty hunter, like we read in that psalm we read there, that uh, talks about as arrows in the hands of a mighty in the quiver. One time, uh, we have possums. I hate possums. We have a possum at these. Every once in a while, we see a possum around our place, and I am not a. I'm a terrible shot. But I kept a loaded 20, a 22 in a case by the back door because that's where we'd see him out behind the house. One time, my wife said, "Hey, there's a possum going." He was on his, on his way down toward the house. We have a little shed up behind there, and he must have been in under that somewhere. And uh, so I got the 22 out. I went out in the back porch and leaned it on a rail post there, and, and uh, it's a semi-automatic 22, and I had the magazine full of shells, and uh, and the possum turned around and headed back where he'd come from. I think I'd hit him once, so, but but he was he was walking back, and I don't know. It's it was probably a distance about uh, oh I don't know the kitty corner across the building here and I kept and that thing kept moving kept moving and finally I had about my last shell in my quiver and I got him so he laid down and died just before he went out of sight around the corner behind that building there so I took me a whole quiver full a whole magazine full to get that little possum well if I go out hunting with a whole quiver full of arrows and I, and it takes a whole thing to shoot one little possum, um, of course we don't eat possums, but you get the picture. I don't have much to put in the freezer if that's all I get is this little animal. Now my brother-in-law, he is a good shot and he's a deer hunter. And he tells about one time he got a deer and a quarter mile away running and he had him in the freezer. He was as good as in the freezer. If my brother-in-law sees a deer a quarter mile away, even if it's running, it's as good as in the freezer. Now, that's what I call a mighty hunter. Do you get the contrast here? Imagine 
If he could about fill a freezer on one arrow, imagine what he could do with a whole quiver full. And that's why it says, if you have arrows in the quiver of a hunter like Louis, <laughs> no, he said, a mighty hunter. And so your children are like arrows, a quiver full of arrows. Imagine the potential that you have there if you're a mighty hunter and how it's diminished if you're not a mighty hunter, if you're a poor hunter. And so I trust that, you know, and I, I trust that you have good stories to tell about what you did with your arrows, because I don't have very good stories to tell about my hunting prowess. But fortunately, uh, we can still have godly families without being a good deer hunter or whatever it may be. But let's watch what's coming into our homes. Let's, let's be diligent. You know, the, so many virtues are on display of a Christian family that is one of the bastions of Zion, and people are looking on them. And it's a witness, too. You know, we're, we're only lights in this dark world. We don't want the glory to be us. The idea of a, glory, of a light is to illuminate other things. And I trust that this... I'm not saying that, hey, we, we get glory because we have good families. I'm saying we are only port lights that show the glory of doing things God's way. And so, do I love Zion? You know, am I a spotlight that's shining on one of those bastions on the citadel of Zion? Or do I like to have it on myself? It's getting kind of Getting kind of long here, I have one last story here about a young man named Bill Borden. And Bill Borden lived back in the early 1900s. And uh, he was born in an upper-class family in Chicago's Gold Coast. He was heir to a fortune in real estate and milk production. And his mother became a Christian, and young Bill began attending church with her. He soon became a Christian himself. He grew up to be committed to Christ and worth $50 million dollars. At a student missions conference in Nashville, he was deeply moved by Samuel Zwemer to preach to the Muslims. And following his graduation, he announced that he was giving his fortune to the cause of world missions. And he was going to preach to the, teach the Muslims. And the night before he went, his widowed mother wondered if Bill had done the right thing, given up fortune and homeland. And Bill himself says, in the quiet of my room that night, worn and weary and sad, I fell asleep asking myself again and again, is it after all worthwhile? In the morning as I awoke, a still small voice was speaking in my heart, answering, God so loved the world that he gave his only begun, his only beloved son. He was only in Egypt about a month and he contacted spinal, spinal meningitis and he was dead within two weeks. And he left a final message on a paper stuffed under his pillow. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. And this story of his sacrifice was retold in newspapers across America, and the publication of his bio biography resulted in a dramatic leap in the number of young people offering themselves as living sacrifices for the Lord of the harvest. And so I trust that that is your goal. Whatever it costs you, you are going to do what you can, in this case for your Christian family. There's just no price too great. Just close with a couple verses here at the end of Psalm 48. Walk about Zion and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that ye may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even until death.